last week we um, we began um, and we touched on something on the bottom of Tezvav on the days, which I just want to repeat briefly so as we go into the sugya. Um, and the, the the discussion there was about maybe eight eight or so lines, maybe ten lines from the bottom. Boy, mine Shmuel me Rav. Shmuel asked the kasha of Rav. So this was the, the question of a, uh, a man who, who steals land, steals title to land, sells it to somebody else. And uh, now before any actions occur from the real owner, the goslin goes to the owner and he wants to buy the property. So he, in, in effect, he wants to legitimize what he did. It seems like because he wants to buy the property after he stole it. So the asked the kasha to Rav, what's the halacha, what's the din if um, if he goes ahead and buys it? What's the question? Because you can ask the question as follows. Does he legitimize the sale for the person who actually bought it? Or does he fit into the shoes of the true owner? The true owner has a right to go back and seize that property. It's his, it's his property. So he has the right to go back and seize that property from the person who bought it from the Gazan. So does he inherit that right? Or does he legitimize the sale to the person to whom the Gazan sold it and he has no right to go back and grab it? That's the real question here that he's asking of Rav. So, so says Rav, so, so we give the answer. Mahu Omale, Rob said, Ma Mochalo Rishon Lashani. What did the Goslin send sell to the second person? Kol Zchush Shetavaliyada. So Rob is saying that he sold him a piece of land, but inherently he sold him all the rights to the land. Any right that comes to the land is his. So according to Rob, if you go back, if the Goslin goes back and buys it from the real owner then he's legitimizing the sale. He can't go back and take it back, which the real owner could, because there's no more rights. He gave over, over all the rights when he sold the land, even though he sold it and it wasn't his, it was a goblin. Nevertheless, Rav says he sold him all the rights. Okay, now what's the reason behind that? And we, that's what we, we were finishing up. So he said, my kama mazutra ama nikhalei velo nikha gazlana. Mazutra says that a person doesn't want to be known as a, as a thief. Therefore, if he legitimizes the property by buying it from the original, he, it automatically goes to him because he doesn't want to be called a thief. And Ravashi and Ravashi says, similar but not the same, that he wants to have a reputation of veracity. It's odd, of course, because he's a gazel, but he wants to, in other words, he doesn't want to be known as a as a as a, as, a, as a liar, as opposed to a goslin, because here he pledged it and gave it to the fellow and sold it to him, and he wants to stand by his own veracity. So me, they right. seem almost the same. They seem like, what's the chilek between when he'd be, be called a goslin, or he's called a, a, a person who doesn't tell the truth? What is the actual difference between the two in this case? That's the kasha. Excuse me, Rabbi. Yeah. Uh, why doesn't he forfeit any of these future possibilities, the minute he stole something, why does he have, it, it, you would think logically, the minute somebody steals something, they've given up all kinds of options that they have in the future. Because right now, when he steals it until nothing happens, he's like a regular citizen. Right. He's, done, he's done a crime and he should be, should have lost something. Right, so but we're seeing here that he's doing so to speak, I say tongue in cheek. He's doing tshuva. He's going to the to the to the person from whom he stole the land, and he says, and he says that, that person doesn't even know the land was stolen, mind you. He doesn't know the title was stolen, and he goes, "I want to buy your property." And the guy says, "Oh, you want to buy my property? Sure, I'll sell it to you for a thousand dollars. I'm happy to pay a thousand dollars." So he's now he's he's making good, so to speak, on his theft. Okay, so yes, he did a bad thing. But he's trying to remedy it. We give him, a, as we say, we're a nation of second chances. We give him a second chance. He can go ahead and buy it outright. The question he, is, when he buys it outright, what happens? Now that he bought it outright, 
what are the what are the rights here? But why doesn't he lose when somebody steals something? The punishment is you pay multiples of what you stole, and there's no way out of that. Correct. Correct. Why for the regular Geneva, you lose certain rights and you have certain penalties. That, that which the Torah says you pay kefel. At, or, or, or that's what you're referring to. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's if his status as a Ganef is established at the time that he is found. If you find him and you know who he is, then you say, I'm going to punish you. I'm going to convict you and punish you with Kefa. But what happens if in the interim, he is no longer a Ganef or a Goslin because he bought it? In other words, I understand your point, Jay. You say a person did something wrong, you should pay the you should pay for the crime. And I we, we all agree that that's the case. But here, the crime was 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 was, was kind of mediated because there is no crime anymore. In other words, do do we do we punish him because he did it, even though he's doing chuva? We say no, he bought it. Now, yes, he was a bad guy, but he had charata. I made a mistake. I, I should buy this and I shouldn't steal it. So he bought it. So he did tshuva. Maybe but Pamali Shemai and maybe, I don't know, but it's certainly we can't do anything to him because he no longer is illegitimate. He bought, he bought the land. So because he bought the land, the question arises, what are his rights? You're right to say he shouldn't have any rights. He stole the land. But now that he did the right thing and he owns the land outright, does he inherit the rights of the real owner? which is to go back and take it back, or since he sold it to that fellow, uh, that person now owns it. So Rob says he has no rights to go back because when you sell something to someone, you sell it to him with all future rights. Kol schus and every schus that will come into his hands, he has now forfeited by selling to, to this fellow. And, and this is a very, very... Um, uh, I would say, I mean, you'll see from our Gemara, from the discussion, it's a very audacious statement that Rob is making because not everybody agrees with him. So, okay, so if we say that that's the case, the Gemara is trying to analyze why. So it brings down two sheets. Mazutra says because a person doesn't want to be called a goslin. And Rav Ashi says because a person wants to stand by his own veracity, which seems similar answers. So the Frech the Gemara, two lines from the bottom, my benayu. What's the difference between the two? So we said that uh, uh, last week, Ika benayu, the mes lokeach, the lokeach dies. Rashi, the very bottom Rashi, we said, the mes lokeach, la'acher shalokho gazel menabalu. In other words, the gazelim went ahead to the true owner and he bought it. After he bought it, the, the person to whom the Gazan sold it died after he bought it. Now the question is, what, what obligations does he have to the Yarshim, to that person's, um, uh, to the person who inherits from the, from the, from the buyer? According to the Pshat of Marzutra, they shouldn't be called a Gazlan, top of Tzazayin of Anala. Or Mesle, he died. If he died, then there's no longer a concern that the buyer will call him a goblin. So he should then now he should have the rights to go back and take the land. According to Ravashi, who says no, it has to do with veracity. So he wants to have this, this reputation of veracity even to the children, to the inheritors of the person. So that's the distinction the Gemara makes, is that if you say it's Goslin, he shouldn't care anymore because he's no longer a Goslin with relation to the buyer. Uh, so therefore he can go take it back, it seems. But if you hold like Ravashi, he wouldn't take it back. Correct the Gemara, sof sof karle bonai lokeach Goslana. What have you accomplished here? Okay, the person died and he can't be, and he, so he won't, can't call him a Goslin. But the inheritors, the children are going to call him a Goslin. So he's impugned the reputation, he's impugned his reputation even to the next generation. So how do you make this distinction? So, so, the, Gemara, so the Gemara says, okay, you're right, it's a valid kasha. So we're gonna look at another way of looking at this. In other words, there is no difference. Now, the one point we made last week, I just wanna repeat, 
and that is that on the Rashi, on the bottom of Tezvav in the days, where Rashi emphasized that our circumstance is that the Goslin bought it and then the Lokeach died. I repeated that many of the Rishonim argue on Rashi. They say, Rashi, that can't be the circumstance because if he died after the, the, um, uh, the, the um, Goslin bought it from the original owner, then at that point in time, if he wants to go back and take it, he would be a Goslin even to the original owner. In other words, Rashi is, is, is saying, you know what? The only reason why this works and is because the owner died after the uh, after the after the Goslin bought it. Then we could say, okay, fine. So so now we say he's a, he's a, he's not a Goslin to the Yarshim. But according to this, according to the Mefarshim, he is a Goslin to the original owner because he bought it and the original owner was alive, which means that it's now his, the original owner's. So if the original owner dies, then he is a Goslin to the original owner, not just to the Yarshim. So, so therefore, the, the, they say that this Rashi is an error and it must mean that he died before the Goslin bought it. He dies before the Goslin bought it, then who are now the owners? The Yarshim. And, and, and the, Gemara said, the Gemara originally said that to the Yarshim, he's not worried about being called a Goslin, only to the original owner. Right, so, so that's the point that we make it. Now, the Gemara takes all that back and says, wait a minute, a Goslin is a Goslin. He's a Goslin to the second generation, just like he's a Goslin to the first generation. Why do you just say that he wants to have veracity to the second generation, but he's not concerned about being called a Goslin to the second generation? That makes no sense, says the Gemara. Okay, so that's, that's where we stop. And it's a good cash in. So now we're still left with the question, what's the chilek between Marzutra and Ravashi. So the Gemara takes a different turn. Okay, four lines from the top. Ela'ika benayu, you know what the difference is? The mes gazlin, the gazlin died, not the lokea, not the buyer. If the gazlin dies, right? And he dies after he bought it from the from the original owner. In other words, he, he sold it, Reuben sold it to Shimon. He then goes to Levi, the original owner and says, I want to buy your property. He buys it from Levi. And after he buys it from Levi, then the Gaza movement dies. So now the question is, what's the status of this property vis-a-vis -vis the Yarshim? In other words, can the Gazlin's Yarshim, can the Yarshim of the one who stole it go back to the Lokeach and say, we want the property back because we now own it? That's the Kasha. So According to this view, Manda Omanikhla in a person doesn't want to be called the Goslin for Mesle. He died. He's no longer going to be called the Goslin, right? He's not he's not here anymore. So according to this view, the Yarshim should be able to go back and take back the property. Lamanda Omanikhla, the lake in Ben Manusa. But according to the view that he wants to have a reputation of veracity, Ochinami Afogav, the mess. Even though the Goslin died, Michele de Lake and Mamnusa. He still wants to have his reputation intact. You know, Ruvain, he was a fine fellow. He was an honest fellow. So therefore, if if he went back and bought the property, he kind of rehabilitated his reputation, and that's okay. Frek the Gemara Sof Sof Karl Benai Bene Goslin. What have you accomplished? Same Kasha as in the first version. The Goslin died. And you're saying since the Goslin died, there's no more concern that he's going to be called the Goslin. But wait a minute, he's he's going to be called that his children will be called the children of a Goslin, because it all started by him stealing, and now that it was he was rehabil rehabilitated because he bought the property, and the Yarshim are going to take it back, then there still will be a cry of he was a Goslin. Look what happened here. So in other words, the Gemara, either way, no matter whether the Lokeach dies or the Goslin dies you can't get away from the fact that he's going to be called a Goslin. So this doesn't work either. 
right? The second circumstance where the Gazlan dies also doesn't work because he's going to be called a Gazlan. So there's no distinction between whether he's a Gazlan or whether he has a reputation of veracity. So the Gemara now has to find a third way of distinguishing between Marzutra and Ravashi. See, when, when, the, when these Amaroyim try to interpret, and, and they do, I mean, very insightfully, they interpret, so it isn't just, okay, he calls him a Gazla and he calls him Hamnusa. There has to be some reason why these Amaroyim are not agreeing. If someone says it's because he's a Gazla, some say it's because it's veracity, it isn't just, oh, I like the word veracity better, I'm going to call it veracity instead of a Gazla. There must be an absolute basic reason why they're saying something different. And so that's the shot in the Gemara here. We're not just playing with words. There's a reason why Marzutra said what he said, or Ravashi said. So we're trying to get to the bottom of why one calls him a goslin, and why one calls him, a, 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 it'll, be a, it'll be an attack on his veracity. What is the killing? So says Rabbi, the Gemara. Rabbi, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, first of all, it seems to me that the whole issue of what he's called would depend on when the deception was discovered, because otherwise, who's going to know to call him a goslin? Who you know, it's his, his secret unless he's discovered. So the whole discussion is moot unless he has been discovered. So the question is, I think, is what? what I mean, when when was? when was this discovered if he sells the property to somebody else and then uh it's not discovered uh until sometime later un until the uh person that he sold it to the guy who sold it to dies that's one situation if if he's discovered before he sells it to the third party before the Goslin sells it to the third party, that's one situation. And if he buys it and dies, uh, he buys it and sells it to somebody else and then dies, it, there, there are three situations, but it depends on at what point. I, it seems to me it, it doesn't well, let, let, jive unless they did, did it's- unless well, I, I, I understand what you're asking, but let, let's stop and think a minute. What happened here? The, the fact pattern is that Ruvain sees an opportunity, Shimon lives in Israel, this property is in Futzlars, Reuben sees an opportunity to make a buck. He, he goes ahead and he forges the title to the property, making himself the owner. Nobody really knows. And then he goes, because Shimon's been away a long time, and he goes to Levi and says, see this piece of property? And Levi says, I'd like to buy this property. So he transacts with him, nobody knows anything. As long yeah, as right. nobody knows anything, everything is fine in the world. Once they find out, Shimon comes back from Israel and he, uh, he wants to uh, move into his property. And Levi says, what are you doing here? Uh, I bought this property from Ruben. He says, you bought the property from Ruben? It's my property. Now the cat is out of the bag and everybody's going to start getting excited. And they're going to say, Ruben, you were a goslin. You forged the signature. Mm -hmm. And it's a bad thing. Now, when that happens, okay, now we have a problem. That was the original Gemara. This Gemara that we just started builds on that and says, Ruvain stole the property. He did everything we just said, but he, he had charata. He said, you know what? I shouldn't have done that. So the way to, for me to remedy this problem is that I'm not going to go back to the buyer and undo the purchase. I'm going to go to the real owner and I'm going to make him an offer. He makes him an offer. Accepted contract. Now, Ruben the Goslin, who sold it when it was when it was a, a theft, has rehabilitated himself because he's now the real owner of the property. No longer can anyone cast aspersions on him that he's a Goslin. So, and, what point is it discovered that he didn't come by it? No, 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 no. Nobody knows yet. No, okay, nobody, no, right. nobody knows anything because. This was all done over time. He bought the property. And if he leaves the status quo, everything will be good. He will never be called a goslin. He will always have his veracity. Nothing will happen. Mm -hmm. The problem arises, says Rav, 
in this discussion. What happens if the Gazan decides, I'm going to take the property back because now that I own it, I inherited the rights of the original owner and the original owner of the property had the right to take it back because it was stolen. So- Well, wait a minute, it has been this, it hadn't been, at what point was it established that it was stolen? It, it, it was, it was, in other words, when Ruven sold it, he had no right to sell it because it was stolen property. So now he wants to reap the benefit of that issue by saying, you know what, Shimon, I sold you a piece of property. I had no right to sell it. I'm taking it back. Now, oh, so he's telling the guy he had no right to sell it. Right. He had no right to sell it because it was stolen. Now, now remember, he's not, Shimon in all cases is going to get his money back. This is not a case of theft where he's going to steal the buyer's money. He's going to give him his money back, but the guy wants the field. The field is what is the value. Yeah. Yeah. So everybody's going to fight over the field, not over the money. So yeah. he says, I'm giving you money back. I want my, I'm going to take my field and I have a right to it because I just bought it. And I bought it legitimately from someone who would have had the right to take it back. So I want to inherit that right to take it back. That's the point here. Says Rob, you can't do that. When you sold it to him, even though you had no right to sell it because you're a goslin, in effect, you sold him all future rights. And, and, and let we'll see why Rob says that. Again, it's a very profound statement. And the Gemara will explain why Rob takes that view, because most of the sages do not take, most of Chazal do not take that view. They don't agree with Rob that when he sold it to him, he sold him all the rights. He had no rights to sell him. He was a goslin. He had no rights on the property to say, you inherit all my rights. But what rights do you have? You're a goslin. So your point is correct, that nothing happens until it comes to light. Once it comes to light, how does it come to light? Because he wants it back. If he didn't want it back, no one would know for a hundred years that he ever stole the property or, or that there was a, 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 a transaction of purchase after the theft. No one would know that. That would Well, he be... just, you just said he admitted to the-, the, the, uh, the Well, he's, he's, he's admitted to the theft because he wants the property back. Yeah. That's where the problem lies. So now, well, if he if he hadn't admitted it, he could have taken it back because he would have been assumed to be the rightful owner. No, no, but he previously sold it already. Remember, he sold yeah. the property as a theft. He, oh, he okay. Sold All title, right. Let's... He sold the property. Now he bought it legitimately, and he wants it back. And he wants. But to... he admitted that he stole it. That he he would have have to have admitted that okay. he stole it because otherwise, Shimon's going to say to him, "But you sold it to me already." So Reuben has to say, yeah, but I, I had stole it at the time I sold it to you. Therefore, I, I had no right to sell it to you. He has to admit it in order to take it back. Oh, I see. okay. Okay. Thank so, you. So, so that is now the machloikis between Marzutra and, and, and Ravashi. So the Gemara asks the question here. So in both cases, whether the buyer dies or the goslin dies, in both cases, he's going to be called a goslin. So what do we do? So now the Gemara has to come up with a third way, and it does. Says the Gemara, about eight, eight or nine lines down at the end, Ela'ika benaya the Yohi b'matana. You know what we're talking about here? We're not talking about a sale at all. We're talking about Ruvain steals a piece of property. Shimon is a very prominent man, and Ruvain wants to curry favor with Shimon. He wants to curry favor with, he doesn't want to sell him the property. He wants to curry favor. So he goes to Shimon and says, Shimon, I want to give you a gift. Here, this beautiful property I'm giving to you as a matana. So Shimon is not buying it. He's getting it as a gift. And he says, oh, very nice, Ruben. Thank you so much. You're giving me a beautiful gift. Now the question is, what happens if Ruben buys, legitimately buys the property from Levi later and he decides, you know what? I don't like Shimon so much after all, I'm going to ask for my property back. So he hasn't sold it to him. He's given it to him a gift and he wants it back. Now the question is, now the question is between Marzutra and Ravashi, what does it mean? 
says the Gemara, Mag according to Rav Ashi, who says that a person wants to have his veracity, he doesn't want to be called an Indian giver. He gave Shimon a gift. And now he's going to come back because he legitimately bought the property. He is not going to go back to Shimon and say, Shimon, I want my property back because that will impugn his reputation for honesty because mm -hmm. then it will come out that he stole it. Yeah, yeah. He doesn't want to do that. But, but according to the Marzutra's view that he doesn't want to be called a gazlan, what did I steal from you? I'd like the property back. Oh, but you gave it to me as a gift. Yeah, but I didn't steal it. So according to Marzutra, a person would not worry about being called a gazlan because there's no gazlanus here. It was given free as a gift. So he's so according to Marzutra, he wouldn't be worrying about his reputation because he's not a gazlan. According to Ravashi, he would be worrying about his reputation because his reputation for honesty is impugned because it's going to come out that he stole it. And because he stole it, he'll be called, oh, this guy, you can never trust him. But you can't call him a goslin because he's taking back legitimately property that he owns, even though at the time he didn't own it. But now that he owns it, if he wants to have the chutzpah of saying, I'm taking my matana back, what argument can Shimon have? Oh, you gave it to me as a matana. Yeah, but I'm taking it back. In other words, if you hold that a matana does not give him inalienable rights, then we're saying that this is a correct interpretation. So again, there's some problem with this because you got to wonder if you gave him to a matana, why should he be able to take it back? But remember, in the context of the Machoikas between Marzutra and Rav Ashi, we're not worried about his ownership. We're, we're only concerned about whether a person would have the chutzpah to go back and to request it because it's mine. I bought it. Yeah, but you gave it to me for a gift. So I don't care. I don't care. I'm taking it back. So what am I going to call you? A goslin? You're not a goslin. Am I going to call you? <laughs> am I going to call you a, a cheater or a liar? Yeah, I'll call you a cheater or a liar, which is which is reputation. That I'll call you. You cheated and you lied. You told me it was yours. You gave me a matana. So in, in, in any event, it's a little bit difficult to draw that line. But the Gemara is trying to distinguish when Marzutra and Rav Ashi might come to a different conclusion as to why one says a person worries about his reputation for honesty, and one worries about his reputation of being called a thief. You can't be called a thief, a, a goslin, if you didn't get remuneration for what you did. Now, you might argue, well, I, I gave him a matana. It, it, it gives me a better reputation, but that's not what the Gemara means when it says gazlanus. Gazlanus means I stole from you. Here, there was no theft because he gave it to him as a gift. So again, it, 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 it's a little bit of a strained uh, a distinction, but a distinction nevertheless for our purposes. So let's take a look at Rashi. The top Rashi, Homeis, Lokeach, Umiich, Apeno, Od. Who's going to embarrass him? So the, so the Gemara says, the Miss Gazlin, after he took it, that's the Pshat. So one view is he died and he doesn't care. He only was concerned about his own reputation, not about what happens after he dies. So, and, and the other says, I forgot the Mus Nichalemi Kara that he wanted to be a good guy. The Leka Behem Nusa, Afilala Achemisa, even after death, a person can be called a um, veracity. And, and we see that in real life. We know from our experience in what we hear about people that if someone was a thief, that label stays with him forever. Now, I, I give you a perfect example. I mean, it, it, an example that we all know <clears throat> is the Madoff example. Now, Madoff was a thief. So there was a question at the time, and, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm only pointing out because of the ambiguity so we can draw something from it. There was a question whether his children should have been indicted together with him because they were part of the scheme. So now, whether they did or didn't isn't material. So the question is, 
is made off the thief? Yeah. Um, the children were the beneficiaries of that debt because they, they, even, they didn't know. Let's say they didn't know, but they got a lot of money as a result of that debt. So for the next generations, as long as the name Madoff will mean something to anybody, they're going to say, oh, you know what? He was a thief. His children? Yeah, okay. They, maybe they were also thieves. So the, 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 the label of thief stays with him even later. Now, what happens if his children had, because remember, after that incident, they started pulling money together from all quarters of the world to try to reimburse the people who had been victimized. So let's say they had pulled all that money together and we started paying, and they did. People got 30%, 40%, maybe less, maybe more. Now, did that rehabilitate the thief? No. So what did it do for the children, for the Yarshim? Well, the Yarshim can say, we had nothing to do with that. Okay, you can't call us thieves. We, we have nothing to do with that, with that. So as far as being called a thief, they weren't a thief. Did it impugn their reputation? Of course it did. Because now when you think of Madoff, you're not only thinking of Madoff, you're thinking of the children. So you see that the reputation has something to do even with the next generation. So now, if the, if the children didn't want their father to be called a thief and they reimbursed every nickel, they would have reimbursed everybody. And he, okay, arguably he's still a Goslin, but he would have been he would, everyone would have been repatriated. So everybody would have gotten their money, but their reputation would not have been intact. So you see, I'm just drawing the parallel that you see the differences between Mazutra and Rav Ashi as to whether someone's called the thief or whether their reputation has been impugned. Not quite the same thing. You can rehabilitate yourself from one, maybe, but from not the other. So the Gemara concludes, no. In the case of a theft, where there is a loss of money, there's no chilek. There is no chilek. That's why the Gemara had to come to a third version and say it has nothing to do with money. It was a matana. He gave him a gift and he wanted to build his reputation because he gave a gift. There, the Gemara says, there's a chilek. The chilek is if someone is not going to be called a thief, he doesn't care if his reputation is sullied because he's not going to be called a thief. He didn't steal anything. By giving a matana, and taking back a matana, the person who received the matana can't say, you stole something from me. There was no theft. You can say that you weren't honest. Yes. So the honesty portion is an issue. And therefore, Ravashi says it's about honesty. Marzutra says it's not about honesty. It's about whether he committed. The Torah says you may not steal. Right? It's, it's one of the Aser uh, Sadibros. You may not steal. Is there any... Is there in the Torah not to have a good reputation? I never heard that before. I didn't hear before that if you don't have a good reputation, you're over a lot. That doesn't exist. So the chile here is when someone says, as long as I'm not a thief, I don't care if my reputation is impugned. It doesn't matter to me. I'm not a thief. I'm just not a thief. That's Marzutra's position. But when it says, you know what? It's not just about theft and Easter. It's about a person's reputation, a shame tov, right? Right. We say that that, that a shame tov is better than shemen tov, says the Mishnah and Perikay Yavis. A person's good name should be protected better, more than some, an expensive oil or something that is of, of greater value. Because a shame tov, once it is sullied, very hard to, to rehabilitate. So the Gemara wants to give that distinction and wants to say that that's ultimately the chilek between, between Marzutra and Ravashi as to whether or not a person, strictly speaking, doesn't want to be over alav, being a goslin, or whether he's more than over alav, he doesn't want his shame toes to be sullied. That's the, that's the Yeah, Michael. Rabbi, Rabbi, what? I have a problem here. When does a gift, you give somebody a gift, you don't realize that its value increases down the road and then you want to take it back. Does it, when does a gift become the possession of the recipient and then you're taking it, it's in their possession. You, you give it and it's handed over. They're, 
their ownership takes over and then you take it back. So the fact that it was once a gift, doesn't that end at some point in time where the ownership is transferred? So, so that's a valid question. And, and the answer to that question is yes, that when you receive a gift, you become, uh, it's violence. You, you become an owner of that gift. If it's a, if, it, if it's a, again, the ownership, Michael, is not different than the ownership of a sale. If it's a, if it's a mobile object, let's say I give you a gift of a, of a horse, a beautiful horse. You take the horse by the bridle, you walk him a couple of steps, it's yours. A piece of land, same way you, you build a fence, you do all those things. So you're it's still a goslin. You're still a goslin. Okay. Just because you took something back after you gave it, at some point you become a goslin. So, so that's where my, okay, right. So therefore my zutra comes back and says, it's not the same where you have no monetary loss. You're, you're right. I mean, we're talking in the abstract. You own it now. Sure, if I take it back, I'm taking back something that's not mine. But my, my zutra is pinpointing that in order for him to be called a goslin, there has to be a monetary loss from the recipient. So he's making a different distinction, not a bylaws distinction. In other words, if I gave you something for free and you own it now, when I take it back, you can't, you cannot say to me, you, you've stolen something from me because I gave it to you for free. Even ah, but I the can, because if I improve that property and I am, and it has even more value than the money I invested, you are, if you're taking it back, you're taking it back plus the additions that I made. So you are taking value. So, oh, so, so, right. So you're asking a, a good question. And the answer would be that this is not about that because he's going to give him the monetary value of what he took. If, if he improved it by 10%, he'll give him 10%. He may even give him 15%. You're, you're right. But the point here is it's between money and the land. He's not stealing it back. He is giving him something of value, but he wants the property. The fight is over the property, not over the value. So in other words, this property, he can say, is, yes, I gave it to you as a gift and I'm taking it back and I'm going to reimburse you in some way for everything about that property, but I want the property. Says Mazutra, you can't call him a goslin. You, all these things are correct. He, he's a bylist. He owns it. It's not right. It's not fair, but he's not a goslin in the strict sense of the word, says Mazutra. Rav Ashi says, but he's, his, his reputation for veracity is shot. Of course it is shot because he's, he's a cheater. He, he, he's a bad guy. That's, that's reputation. But is he a goslin? Especially if we reimburse him. Because the Gemara always said that there was an exchange that he got his money back. He was never out the money. It was about the land. And here, and this is a tremendous Chiddush, that according to Mazutra, as long as he's not a goslin in the strict sense of the word, he can do this. It's unsavory. It doesn't sound right. It's not something that a Jew should do. But is he a goslin? Mazutra says no. So again, it's instructive to us because you see, in a way, how this distinction now between Mazutra and Ravashi is really splitting a very fine line as to what, as to what, whether what he's doing is legitimate or not legitimate. But okay. what, what would what would a what would a base din do about it? If you oh. take back a gift, and the person you took it back from does not want to accept the reimbursement, so that's a good question. The base din would restore the gift the gift so, to so, you. So, so, so uh, uh, my guess is with the halacha, they they would not. And by the way, um, we're we're running into a complicated situation here. Most of the, um, in other words. Most of the um, uh, Rabbonim, Rabbonon, hold against Rav. So in other words, if it came to Bezden, Bezden would not give it back. Okay, the, 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 the body of opinion is against Rav. The problem we have is that Rav is the God of Ladar. And we say that when Rav makes a pronouncement, we hold like Rav. So now we have Rav and we have all the other Rabbonim. So that's the problem. I mean, the, 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 the Mepharshim talk about this and they say, we have a dichotomy here because on the one hand, everything that we've said here today, common sense takes place 
and common sense tells us what the halacha is. And that's the halacha like the rabbin. But Rav made a pronouncement. And, and this pronouncement is taken as the black letter law. We hold like Rav. So what do we do here? So my, my answer would be that al-pi halacha, I don't think a Bezdom would allow him to take it back. That's the halacha. They would not allow him to take it back for the, all the reasons that have been raised here and the questions that have been raised here. But you still have to deal with Rav. And, and you can't just say, oh, Rav made a mistake because we, so, so this is the problem of this kind of I- I issue is that the, the halacha is halacha karabin, uh, but yet Rav, it goes against the Rabin. Most, most of the time when someone goes against the Rabin, we don't worry. But when you have someone like Rav, and he goes against the rab, the the, uh, the rabbin. Then we have a then we have a concern. But we don't hold like rab in matters of monetary. Uh, yeah, no, uh, no, we don't hold like rab. But we, we, we let's put it this way: we we're a little bit concerned because although the halacha is not like that, we still have rab to deal with. <laughs> okay, so maybe this is a teku situation, and uh, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to wait and figure out what rab meant, and and we're not gonna be able to get to it today. But you're gonna see. In, in, the, in the following Gemara, what Rav bases his opinion on. Rav is not necessarily a Yachid because he has a very legitimate uh, basis of his opinion, but still, he's not the Rabbin. Okay, so th- th- this is, it's a, it's a little bit of a controversial issue. That's not, okay. But nevertheless, we're trying, we were trying to draw a fine line and understand the chilek between Marzutra and Lavashi, what, what they were saying. All right. So now we have the two dots and we're going to introduce yet another complication into this Gemara. So right now we have a situation where Goslin sells the property, Ruven sells it to Shimon, Levi is the owner, Ruven buys it legitimately from Levi. And the question was, vis-a-vis Ruven and Shimon, what's the halak? How do they deal? Now let's compound the problem. Pshita says the Gemara, okay, Pshita usually means, oh, it's simple, okay, we're, we're, we're saying, the Gemara is saying that this is a simple um, uh, uh, situation, okay, it's not so simple, um, so Pshita, Zavna Urta Biyava Bamatana, if a person, okay, we have our fact pattern, right, Reuben sells it, Reuben sells it to Shimon, the movement is a goslin, sells it to Shimon, and then we have Levi. Now, Ruvain wants to buy it back from Levi, right? But before he buys it back from Levi, he sells it to Yehuda. So now Ruvain sold the movement is the goslin, he sold it to Shimon. He's about to buy it from Levi, but before he buys it from Levi, he sells it again. He's a real. This is a real uh, here, and he now he sells it a second time to Yehuda. So this property has now been sold twice, illegitimately. It's a gazlin, or Urta. He wrote it over to his son as a bequest. In other words, in his will. In other words, he he said he said uh, Yisachar, you, you're the owner of this land. Or the other matana, or he decides he wants to curry favor, and he goes to Yosef and says, "Yosef, you are the uh, you are the emperor, or you are the you are the, the macher. Take this beautiful piece of land." What has he done here? He's taken ownership of this land and given it to somebody else, not to the person who he sold it to illegitimately, but to another person. So now we have a fact pattern that's even more complicated, and the Gemara's kasha is going to be when Reuven finally decides, I, this isn't a good situation, I'm buying this property from Levi. So now he's going to go to Levi. Levi knows from nothing. He goes to Levi, Levi, here's $1,000. Levi says, $1,000, I take it. So now that he buys it, here's the question. Reuven now legitimately owns the land. Who has rights? Does Levi have a right? Does Yehuda have a right? 
Does Yosef have a right? Does anybody have a right who has now been bequeathed this land before Reuven buys it back? That's the Kasha. That's now the Kasha. We've twisted this into a total pretzel and we want to understand what, who has what right, right? Okay. Now, by the way, this is centuries ago, a couple thousand years ago. Fast forward to today. Can well, we have title insurance. You have Can't title you insurance today. What's that? You have title insurance today. Yeah, this title is insurance. Like pay for title insurance. A and exactly right. But can't, but can't you see this happening today? I can. Yes, yes. I can. Somebody sells a property twice and three times? Of course. And it's that's why title insurance may be worth every penny. That's why title um, insurance became such an important factor. But yeah. so now, absent title insurance, how do you untangle this mess? Says the Gemara, Zavna Urta Biabdam Latana, Lavlo Ukme Kamil Lakir Koboy. It's stating the obvious, but it basically means if he does all these things, he's not doing it for the benefit of Shimon, of the person who he originally sold it to. Remember the previous Gemara, we said that if a Gazlan steals property and then buys it, what, is, what does Rav say? It automatically belongs to Shimon because when a person sells, he sells all Zechusim. Remember, this is Rav. This is the, the Gadol Ador. Rav is saying, you know what? I, you may not agree with me, you other Rabbanim. I, I appreciate that, but I am making a pronouncement that when, that when I sell something to somebody else, I'm giving them unequivocal rights. If I'm giving them unequivocal rights, now when I go back and I legitimately buy the property according to Rav, who does it belong to? It belongs to Shimon. Okay, the Gemara says, Pshita, if a person does all these, these things, it's clear he's not doing it for the benefit of Shimon. Why would he sell it to Yehuda? Why would he give a gift to Yosef? I mean, come on. If, he's, if, if the halacha is that he's doing it for Shimon, it belongs to Shimon. This is a Gavaldiga. So the Gemara is now introducing to us a circumstance which is very convoluted, but here you have a problem. So according to Rob, it shouldn't matter, but the Gemara is saying it's clearly an indication that he's not intending to help Shimon here because he sold it to somebody else. Now, okay, put that aside for a minute. Says the Gemara Vaita, Nopoli Birusha. What happens if the Goslin was the nephew of the Nigzal? In other words, Ruvain was the nephew of Shimon, but he couldn't wait. He stole it from his uncle because he couldn't wait. Now, the, the uncle dies and automatically Reuben becomes the owner. He didn't buy it. It automatically came to him, be Yerusha. Says the Gemara, not lay be Yerusha, Yerusha memelehi, v'lad ihu kotorech abasrei. He didn't do anything for it. Therefore, says the Gemara, he did not mean to legitimize his sale to Shimon because it's not as if he did tshuva. Remember, we talked about the whole tshuva thing. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and buy it, and this way it'll be kosher, and I'll give it to Shimon. He got it to Yerusha, says the Gemara. If he got it to Yerusha, he, he didn't mean to help Shimon because he got it to Yerusha. So again, this is a problem for Ram. Gavahi Bechovo, let's say that Ruvain was Shimon's creditor. He had loaned him $1,000. He didn't wait to get it back. He stole the property. He took the property from his debtor and he sold it to Shimon. Now, after he sold it to Shimon, Ruvain goes back to Levi and says, Levi, uh, you owe me $1,000. I, I, want, I want this property as collateral for my $1,000 because you haven't paid me that. So how is he getting the property ownership? through collateral that he, that he got from the Balchog. So the Gemara asks, is this like Yerusha, where it happened by itself, or is it like something else where he legitimized the sale to Shimon? The, the Kasha is, since Reuben got the land back and he, he already sold it to Yosef or, or he sold it to Yehuda, now he got it back because he was the creditor to the to the Nigzal, to the person from whom he stole the property. So the Gemara is asking the question, 
whether or not Rav's pronouncement that anytime you sell something, you sell all the zechusim applies or not. Because now we got it back. But he got it back after selling it illegitimately to Shimon. Does it mean that it's automatically Shimon's by right because he got it back as a creditor or as a gift, whichever, or not? Okay, so these are all complicated facts on top of our issue. Are we all clear as to what happened? Right? So now the Gemara has to untangle this web. Okay, before we untangled the web of, of, of whether or not you can legitimize a theft after by buying it. Now we complicated it because not only did you legitimize it in some fashion, but it's no longer, you sold it a second time or you gave it away. So if you gave it away, you clearly didn't mean to rehabilitate the original sale. So the kasha is, what do we do here? Do we go like Rob? Because Rob says it doesn't matter what you do. When you sold it to him, you sold him forevermore all the rights that you had to it. Now that you have it for Yerusha, okay, now it's his. It belongs to Shimon. Now that you have it as a creditor, it's okay. It belongs to Shimon because you're legitimizing the original improper sale by now owning it. That would be Rob's view, right? Those who say not like Rob say, wait a minute. He's not legitimizing anything. This is a whole new circumstance. So this whole Gemara now will turn on the question of whether or not we hold like Rob or not. So that's what the Gemara is trying to get to. Um, so, um, but in the case of a Chol, the Gemara does have two different views. Yabehi Chovo, Chazino, says the Gemara, we're going to take a look. The answer to the question is whether or not it's his or not. If the uh, the person from whom the land was stolen, right? He's, he's the Nixal. He is the person who owes the money to Reuben. Now, Reuben the Goslin comes and says, I want, I, I want this property. I, I want this property. So the Gemara says the following. If Shimon, the Nigzal, is a multimillionaire, he owns properties everywhere. If Reuben comes and says, you know what? I want to collect on this property, the property that he falsely took and sold to Shimon, he wants to legitimize. So he comes to, to, the, to the debtor, to the Nigzal, and he says, you know what? You see, you have a nice property over at the corner of Arcola and Kersey. I want that property, says the Gemara. That means he wants to legitimize his theft and give it to who? To Shimon. Because he wants to, according to Rob, since he really gave it to Shimon, Shimon owns it, this would be proof positive that he wants to legitimize the sale and give it to Shimon because he's asking for this property. The Elo, the Elo But what happens if he doesn't have other property? If he has other property and he asks for this, that it's a raya that he wants it. The Elo Zuzi who now, if on the other hand, if on the other hand, um, he comes and says, I want this property, and this property is the only property that he has, and that he doesn't have other property, then in that case, it says the Gemara that, that, um, that he cannot, it's, it's not a raya that he wants to legitimize the person, because he has no other property to collect from. So in other words, the, the chilek in being a balchov to you is that if you're a balchov and you want this property out of many, he wants to rehabilitate the first sale. If there aren't many properties, this is the only one, it's no raya, it's no proof that he comes to legitimize the first sale. So that's what the Gemara is telling us with regard to balchov, that there is a chilek. Right. Now, what is what is the basis for this machlaikis? So now we're going to get into the substance of it. Pligibor of Achav Ravina. There's a machlaikis between Rav Achav and Ravina. Chad Amar Matana Ki Yerusha. The Hamemela. One says Rav Achav actually says that a matana giving it as a matana is like Yerusha. That it's Memela. Therefore, there's no proof that he wants to re rehabilitate. 
The Chad Omar Matoner Kemechen, that a Matoner is like a sail. The E love the Torah. The Arche Kamei, if he hadn't curried favor with the with the debtor, he wouldn't have given him matana. So, in other words, he curried favor with him in order for him to give him a matana. So, this machlokes is a side machlokes to our gemara, because in this machlokes we're we're seeing that if someone gives a matana, then um, then there's a discussion of whether or not the matana legitimizes the first sale or not. But in any event, the kasha still remains. What do we do here? Do we say that if a person sells to a third person, does he, is there a circumstance where he's legitimizing the first sale and therefore it belongs to the first one like Rav? Or do we say he's not legitimizing and therefore it's a totally separate transaction and this would go against Rav because then there would not be, it wouldn't go back to the first guy. So this is what this Gemara, I mean, it's a complicated situation, but the Gemara is giving us different circumstances under how we should look at this. If it's a straight purchase, or if he winds up getting a Rusha, or if he winds up as a debtor and he gets the property back, there are different components to this as to whether or not a person intends to rehabilitate the first thing. Okay, that, so that's okay. Let's pick up the Rashi. Zavna Arta im kodim shalokach min abalim. So this is what we said before buying it from the Balim, Chazar umachra leishacher. He sells it to we said Yehuda levad min arishin or harisha leechad mibanov or he gave it as Yerusha to one of his children or yeva b'matana or he gave it as a matana to yet somebody else. The achakach lokach. And after doing one of these things, he buys it from the Nigzal, from the original owner. He's certainly revealing his mindset. He's not doing to legitimize the original sale. And he doesn't care about his veracity. He clearly blew up his veracity because now he's now entangled another person. No one is going to say he's honest. He sold it to a third person. He didn't mean to improve his veracity by buying it and giving it to the first person. He sold it to the third person. Nuflale. Now, what happens if, if he gets it to Yerusha because he's the nephew, let's say, of the of the of the Nikdal? Nuflale le Gazlin be Yerusha shemepchil of Gazla le Echad me Marisha. He stole it from one of his um, uh, the person who he's going to inherit. Umeis ha Nikdal and the Nikdal dies. So he, he couldn't wait for his inheritance, so he stole it. Yerusha memelehi, says the Gemara, no. For so you can't say he wanted to improve his reputation. The holotorah habasre, because he didn't work for it. The name of Goli Dati, the Nikhalei Delekev, Delekev. Clearly, he didn't, he didn't care. Hilka habike Yerish, he's just like a Yerish. The Alma, the Choyzer Vitoyve, and us and Morrison Lokay. So again, Rashi emphasizes this, and I've emphasized it many times. It, it's not as if he isn't going to repay the guy. He's going to repay the buyer. Remember that. That's always the case here. The buyer is never going to be out his money, but he doesn't want his money. He wants the property. That's the chilet. So, so when we call him a goslin, we understand that he stole it. What did he steal? He didn't steal the money because he's giving him the money. The terrorist is that by taking the property back, it's the property that he's stealing because the property has a, an intrinsic value that is more than the money. It's not just, oh, I'll give you your money back, we'll be even Stephen. That's not why he went into the transaction. He went into the transaction because he wanted to buy this property. He, he, it, was, it was next to his house. He wanted to be able to build a bigger house, for instance, or, or for whatever reason, he wanted his kids to have a house next to him. It doesn't matter. The fact is that this property had a certain value that supersedes the value of the money. Gavai Bechovo, Nachash Gozlo, says Rashi, Umachalo, Ubolo, Eitzel Nix of Omolo, Higbiali Bechovo, Kakash Gozlo. You know what? This property that you own, I, I want this property for my, for my mortgage that I have with you. 
So the Gemara says, "E isle arash weki lenigzo." If the nigzo had other property, shiyocha linkos chovam imena, where he could buy v'amalu bezu shagazalti ani chafet. I want this property. A Torah habasrei, he's working for it. For aminan meuk me kamelokeach boy, that he wants to legitimize the first sale. So what's the Gemara telling us? The Gemara is telling us that if you work hard to get a piece of property, the chances are you're doing it to rehabilitate yourself. In other words, you're going out of your way to get a piece of property to legitimize what you did improperly by stealing the property. That's how the Gemara looks at this. Otherwise, why is he wasting his time? But what does he care about this property? He wants this property so that this property can be paid off for the gazelle. But if he, if he didn't have other property, if, if the, uh, the Balchov only had this one property, then it's no raya, it's no proof that he, want, that he wants to rehabilitate because if he's going to collect this chov, where is he going to collect it from? He only has one property to collect. We can't, it's not proof positive that he wants to rehabilitate what he did. That, that's what the Gemara is saying. So, so then the Gemara has to result, result to the to the to the coming and saying, "Bamatona pligi, bamatona nigzel legazlin." It wasn't a sale, just like we said in the Gemara before, right? By so so, we said that it, it wasn't about money; it was about a matona. The matona pligi says Rashi nigzel legazlin, and therefore that's the machlokes of Achav Ravina. What is a matona? So Rav Acha says Matana is for Yerusha and it's no Raya because he comes to it just by accident. Therefore, he's not looking to rehabilitate. And Ravina says Matana Kamecha, that a Matana is like a sale. And just like a sale, a person, you know that he wants to rehabilitate. He loved the Torah for Artikame. If he hadn't worked hard to curry favor to get it back. So there, it's more like he wants to legitimize himself and he wants to give it back. So again, this Gemara somewhat parallels the Gemara above. And, and the Gemara says basically here, the Kashib was on Rav. What does Rav do with this? Because according to Rav, he automatically is the owner for all future purchases. So the Gemara wants to find a way to not have a Machlekes on Rav, because with these other circumstances, we see that there is a machlek. It's just like we said before that all the other chachamim and uh, rabbanon are saying that there is no schus and therefore all these other things can happen. And Rav says, wait a minute. There's, there's, so we want to split the difference and we want to say, you know, Rav is right because in a circumstance where it's clear that he went out of his way to legitimize his original sale, then it means it belongs to the original fellow. But where it's not clear, then we don't hold like Rav. So, so again, that that's that's the, how the Gemara positions itself. So the Gemara says at the end, yeah, but we're not talking about Mecher, which is what Rav is talking about. We're talking about Matana, as if to say, and the Kasha came up before, and I, uh, very validly, I think Michael asked it, is but but with the Matana, there's also an Indian, the Chayra, an Indian of Gazela. Because you're you're giving it and you're taking it back. So again, we're making that distinction. And strictly speaking, yes, he owns it, but since no money was transacted, so you can't call him a goslin. You might call him a cheat. Okay, he's a cheat because he, he gave a gift. Now he's taking back a gift. But strictly speaking, goslonus means where you steal money, and there was no theft of money because he gave it to him as a matan. So again. Uh, we're, we're still in the middle of this. We're going to have to pick it up. But you see these distinctions now, how the Gemara has compounded it. And, and yet the pattern remains the same, whether, whether it's one person or two people or he sold it to a third person. Um, there's still, the question is, what was his intent? So if his intent was to rehabilitate the first person, then we say, Rob says, that's exactly what he meant, that he meant to... Uh, to rehabilitate, but in a, in a case where he, he didn't mean to rehabilitate because it came from, let's say, the Yerusha or, or the Matana, then there is a machlokes, and Rav says, nevertheless, it belongs to the first person. The other, um, the, the other chachamim who, who dispute say, no, you can't extrapolate from that that it belongs to him because he never intended to give it to, to legitimize the first transaction.
But we do have a concept of a sukkah gazela and a lulav gazela, and they're not me. Right, right. Well, well, again, because there you have a mitzvah derisa in the Torah. So what you're doing is you're negating a mitzvah derisa with with this. The difference is here, th there is no positive mitzvah that you're that you're violating. You just you're over the law. In other words, when you're over a law, it's one thing. When you're over a law and not doing the mitzvah, now you have two different. You, you know, there's two sides to that coin. Uh, 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 selling a piece of property, there's no mitzvah involved. You're just selling a piece of property, but you stole it. Okay, so you're, there's a lot of involved, but there's no corresponding mitzvah. When you do a, a lulav gazel or a sukkah hagazel, so the, now it's a mitzvah habob avera. So now you're in a whole different realm. You're talking about even something uh, totally different. But, now, but if you give stolen property to to the base amigdash as hektish, then you there too. There too. That now you're violating hektish exactly. Or, so now or, you're or in this case here, and we go go, go with lulav gazel and so on. What if you don't? You're you bought this property from the Goslin. You didn't know it was the Goslin. You go ahead and start farming it. You go ahead and reap, and, uh, you know, and you and you you harvest, and now you, you start getting miser and truma. And right. then in the middle of all this, you find out that it was stolen. Right. So that you're right. That's even a bigger complication. What happens yeah. <laughs> in that circumstance where you've already dedicated? And, and, and it was a false dedication because it was a, it was a dedication based on Gisela, right? Because it was stolen yeah. property and now you gave hectic. That's, that's, that's a very complicated, uh, you have to think about that because now it's not just you and the Goslin. Now it's you and the Goslin and, and, and the Bunishlan. And, or, and, and the Cohen and the Levy who took the money. And the Cohen and the Levy. <laughs> right, right. So now you've created a whole chain and the question is how you undo that chain. That's a very interesting question. I'll have to look at that because... Um, uh, the, the question is whether or not uh, Kedusha can be chal on, on something that came as a Dover Issa. In other words, you clearly know that if someone got a, um, uh, a, an unkosher animal, an unkosher animal, and used that as a carbon, then there is no basis for it because it was, um, it, it was never Lemaisa, right? In other words, your, your hypothesis, if it was based on a Dover Issa, it, it, right? No problem. The, your question is, is, is Gizela like Hadavah HaAsr? Is it like, let's say, if, if, if you stole it and now you build this whole building of Kedusha, so what happens since its basis was Gazlanus and it was an Isr? So the question is, are all Isurim alike? And then clearly we know that if it was, uh, if, if it was um, some, one kind of an Isr, it would have no Chal, no Kedusha's Chal. The question is, is Kedusha Chal on a different kind of Isra? And that's a, that's a question that we have to take have to take a look at. In other words, are all Isurim the same? That's the question, because we know it's not the same if, if it's based on, 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 uh, on certain Dover Isurim. So that's a good question, uh, Menashe. I have to take a look. Take a look. But, um, uh, but the Maisa, again, we see how complicated this now becomes, is how many, you know, how many layers do we have to peel back in order for us to, and again, so this is this is halacha lemaisa because you know today in our complicated world, there are many things that happen as a result of other things that may have not been legitimate. So the question becomes how you entangle, how you peel back the layers of the onion to 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 figure out when you get back to step one, um, how do we do that? And, and and so that's why we have such complicated cases today in the in the bate dinim. In business, especially where there are many people's rights, and you have to sort out those rights, uh, la halacha. So, the, so the, the the good news is that the the halacha, the core of the halacha, is always very very clear. So now the case, our cases have to somehow comport with the case of the halacha, which at the time no one ever contemplated. But you see that the Gemara hypothesizes things that. We know clearly happened today. I steal from you. I sell to one. I sell to two. I mean, these are all unfortunately ma'aseh b'chol yom. These things happen. But the Gemara hypothesizes and tries to give us an understanding of who has legitimate rights for what. And the Gemara has said something here. That's why Rav makes his pronouncement because Rav wants to be very clear. When you sell something to someone, even if the original sale was not legitimate. 
his rights remain forever. So now, Rob gives us a, 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 clear, a clear fact pattern. He gives us a roadmap to say that that buyer has certain rights even later on. Not everybody holds like that, but that, that was the greatness of Rob's view, even though you know, the Robin didn't hold like that, is that he has schusim. He has schusim, you can't take away those schusim, otherwise, so to speak, you'd be breaking the, 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 whole, the whole normative uh, understanding of transaction. If you say that you make a transaction that's not legitimate, later you can make you delegitimize it, then, then when is there ever a legitimate transaction? How many doras, like someone asked, how many doras do you have to go before you can say it's no longer a matana? Uh, or how many doras do you go before you say, wait a minute, this transaction has already been ingrained, you can't undo it. And that becomes a halachic problem is if you can't trace back and say, this happened, now we go from here. So Rav makes that pronouncement. Those who dispute Rav say, not so fast. It, there isn't a legitimacy automatically when, when, when he bought something that was not uh, a, proper, a proper transaction. So again, the, the, you, you, again we're scraping away and we, we realize how complicated um, these fact patterns are. So um, again, that's the beauty of it. But for our purposes, we're, we're trying to sort of untangle. So Mitzvah, next week, we're going to pick up from this Let's keep in mind that that the the common denominator of, of the first Gemara and the second Gemara, interestingly, is that the way to try to reach a compromise, the Gemara says, is with a matana, not with a mecha. So keep that in mind that when it comes to to sale, these two views clash. The view of Rav and the view of the others clash when it comes to a sale. When it comes to a matana, which is a step down from what one could say is, is a theft. Okay, you may still argue, oh, you gave it to me, it's mine, but it's not the same. So that's where you can reach some kind of a compromise when it's a step below. It's a matana, it's not a mecher. So that tells us something, that with mecher, you really have more of a complicated issue than with a matana, even though a matana, when you give it, should be a legitimate transaction and the person should have rights. And the answer is he has rights, but He's not a gosling. Now you say you may say, but it's semantics. Teretz is in the in the Torah. It's not semantics. It's not gazela. It's not gazela. But at the same time, uh, giving a gift, uh, kind of a, being an Indian giver, isn't something that we take lightly. I mean, we gave him a matana; it should be his. So, uh, but nevertheless, it's not gazlan. So, if that's it, if that's the solace here, that's the uh, that's the common denominator. So, Mitchum will pick up next week. The Gemara really goes even further. Uh, but next week, hopefully, we'll, we'll see the Gemara that legitimizes Rob. Because Rob is really on the hot seat here because he is against all the other majority by saying that schusim, um, that once you give something, the schusim in the future go with it. And that's clearly not what uh, the road holds. So we'll, we'll look at that next week and uh, we'll pick it up. That's Thank you.